It is Binjang 91.5, and it's time for Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. I'm in Studio 2. Good afternoon, Matthew. Hey, good afternoon, Tony. Great to be chatting to you again. Yes. Now, tell me, what could be more fun than someone else doing the mowing for you? It's hard to imagine, isn't it, Tony? If you came and offered to mow my lawn for me, I think that'd be pretty good. I might even sit at my deck and watch you mow the lawn for a bit of extra fun. But there is something that I think is just a little bit more fun, and maybe it's my technology bent. But about 10 years ago, I bought my first robotic lawnmower. It was a brand called Robomower. They don't exist anymore, which is a bad sign. But it sits there and mows the lawn automatically for you. A couple of years ago, that that mower finally failed after about eight years of service, and I I bought a new one from another brand. But... Victor has now unveiled their robotic lawnmower. And and I think this is going to be a bit of a game changer because people know and love the Victor brand and they associate Victor so much with lawn mowing, with lawn mowers. Unfortunately, it's owned by an overseas company now. Briggs and Stratton have bought the actual brand, but people still associate Victor with mowing the lawn and your lawn mower. So the fact they've now brought out a robotic lawn mower to me is a big deal. And the robotic lawn mower, if you've never seen one in action, it's a bit like a Roomba, if you've seen one of those in action, where it'll go along, it'll sense the wire on the edge of the lawn, which you put down beforehand, obviously, and then it turns a random number of degrees and starts mowing again. If it runs into something like a tree or a bit of furniture, it just bumps into that pressure sensor and then turns around and keeps going again. Fascinating to watch. In fact, it's quite entra- like you can be entranced in watching it and sitting there watching a robotic lawnmower is, is sometimes what takes as much time as actually doing the lawn yourself because you just sit there and you're just fascinated by the process and how it all works. But the convenience factor is fantastic. You don't have to worry about it. Your, your lawn will be mowed twice a week automatically. It'll undock, mow the lawn, dock itself again, charge the battery up. So even though they're a bit expensive compared to a normal lawnmower, and this particular Victor's about $1,300, I think when people factor in the amount of time they save and the petrol they put in over a few years, I think they'd find that it's probably not a bad investment. So look out for those Victor lawnmowers on lawns around your place, Tony. Well, I can see that they're becoming more popular by the day. Absolutely. Now, now where can you get a drink of water in the desert? I mean... In Australia, that could be a good question. It's a, it's a fantastic question. And the answer is from the air, which sounds ridiculous. But a new device is being developed by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it can extract water from almost dry air. And it uses a combination of things. Effectively, what it does is it uses heat from sunlight during the day to give you a, a sustainable source of water. And basically, it uses that sunlight during the day generates the energy from that, and then during the night, as long as there's at least 20% of moisture in the air, and most times, even in the desert, there's more than that, it will extract water from the air overnight. Now, there have been some devices previously that have been able to collect water from fog, but you need those specific geographic conditions and the right weather conditions to actually generate fog in the first place before you actually generate water from it. But this here only needs that 20% of moisture to be able to generate some water. So it seems quite incredible. It seems like it would be revolutionary in some of our desert areas around Australia, but certainly around the world. People have major issues with water, obviously, in terms of being able to have water. Clean drinking water is a a major issue in some third world countries. But to give you an idea, the the initial prototype device is effectively a, a box. It weighs about seven kilograms, and in tests they've already done, they've been able to generate 0.77 litres of water, so just under a litre of water, for every square metre of solar absorber. So again, don't expect to put a little unit in and generate a whole uh, enough water for a village, but the ability to scale that up is the important thing. So as you start to scale that up, for every square metre of, of solar absorber you've got, you're generating almost a litre of water. So you can see the implications for that if you have enough solar absorbers in a village to be able to generate fresh drinking water for a village. Quite incredible. Hmm, certainly is. Now, has the state government solved the problem of copying a digital licence? Because obviously people uh, use licences to identify people. Yeah, you, you're spot on. And at the moment, the New South Wales government has given up and they've gone back to the drawing board. They thought they had a viable solution to allow businesses to take a copy of 
of a digital driver's license. And for example, you walk into a bank and you need to open up a bank account. The first thing they'll ask you for is a couple of forms of ID, especially photographic ID. And typically one of the things people use is their driver's license. Back in the old days, you'd pull the plastic driver's license out of your wallet or out of your, your pocket and they would take a copy of that driver's license and then use that to identify you. What the government was hoping to do was to give you the ability to do that with other organisations that were going to participate in this program to allow you to give that digital ID in a safe and secure way and then have that organisation be able to access that information to make sure that Tony Graham really was Tony Graham with that lovely photo of Tony not smiling on the driver's licence. But there's been a few hiccups along the way. Uh, one of those, of course, we did talk about it uh, probably a month or two ago now, when 54,000 licenses were essentially left open on Amazon Web Services and people could actually look at those driver's licenses and, and take copies of all that information, which is terrible from an identity theft perspective. So the government got in a little bit of trouble around that one, but they've basically given up on their current solution. They've gone back to the drawing board. They're still hoping to get to the point sometime next year where you'll be able to walk into a bank with your driver's license on your phone and be able to still yep. identify yourself and go forward from there. One of the reasons they're really focused on this at the moment, Tony, is that the uptake of digital driver's license has been much more than they estimated. It went live last October, so it's been out there for about a year. 1.7 million people have downloaded it so far, and that's ba it's basically about 31% of all license holders in New South Wales. They'd previously estimated, Service New South Wales, that only about 12% of motorists would actually take up the digital option in the first 12 months. So I think they've been a bit surprised about how many people have taken it up. And one of the things that I noticed, I, I actually participated in the trial initially and then went forward with the full-blown version. But one of the things that's nice about it is if you've got anything else registered with Service New South Wales, for example, if you had a working with children check or if you had a gun licence, they automatically show up in the app as well. So you don't have to worry about trying to keep all those different licences or bits of information that's all just there in that one app. Yes. What about uh, if you lose your phone or someone steals your phone, Matthew, what would you do then? Oh, panic is usually the best option, Tony. <laughs> that's uh... <laughs> That's my biggest concern with that. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I talk to people to often about doing things on phones is making sure you've got some security on there. Some people say, I don't want to worry about a pen, it's too much trouble, or don't worry about my fingerprint or my face ID. But just for some basics, exactly as you've mentioned there, just for some basics, having some security on your phone is important. If you do lose it, the great thing about something like the Service New South Wales app is you go and get a new phone, you download that app again, sign in as yourself, and all your information is still there. So it's not stored on your phone effectively, it's stored in the cloud. But if you leave your phone completely open, then unfortunately someone can access that information. Yeah, and then of course, if you do secure it, for example, um, say, say you have a, a, an accident and you, and you kick the bucket and someone needs to, your spouse needs to access your driver's license and other information, it makes me wonder, well, what would you do in those circumstances? Yeah, and it's a good question, and I'm sure Service New South Wales would have the ability for a spouse to come in with a death certificate, unfortunately, which is, sounds a little bit morbid, but that's the way you've got to prove that your spouse is no longer with you. I'm sure they'd have a process that they could go through to be able to either issue another physical driver's license or give you access to that. Mm. And you'll be listening to Matthew Dickerson with Tech Talk on Binjang 91.5. Stay tuned next week, all at the same times, on a Tuesday, Tuesday. No better day than a Tuesday because, it's, because we're listening to Tech Talk. And it's back to the music and the great information on Binjang 91.5. Thanks, Tony.